I suppose that perhaps no people are more intuitively responsive to the dynamics of musical expression than other people of the Soviet Union. And yet, strange to say, few people have enjoyed so casual a contact with the art of music. The history of music in Russia is a tale of prohibition and frustration, of patronage and folly, of pride and fear. It's the story of a nation shut away from the world, a nation which missed the adventures of the Renaissance, a nation which, when at last it awakened from its long sleep, set about to test its strength by meekly imitating the masters of the Baroque. And when that strength was tested and found sure, so the nation became proud and self-possessed and spoke to the world through masters of its own, masters whose every quaver bore the stamp of Russia. But above all, it's the story of a great dilemma, a great conflict, that of a nation confronted by the need to nourish itself upon the art of the Western world, and yet tortured by the idea that from the West might come the corruption which would spoil the sacred innocence of its own inheritance. It's astonishing to think, isn't it, that at the end of the 17th century, when the Western world had developed its musical vocabulary to an extent which made it ready for that colossus, Sebastian Bach, to come and synthesize the achievements of four centuries, to sum up the glories and complexities of polyphonic technique, that there existed in Russia neither knowledge nor practice of this strange art of the West. There existed only the sacrosanct presence of the ageless chants and rituals of Byzantium. The church in Mother Russia held music to be a sinful practice, an instrument of temptation. The polyphonic style, the welding of melodic voices together, moving them in similar directions. The basis of all music in the West since the Middle Ages was expressly forbidden, since in their view it could not but compromise the modal integrity of the Orthodox liturgy. And so it could, and did. It was the outlook of the cosmopolite Tsar Peter I that finally turned Russia from the contemplation of its medieval past to the examination of its contemporary position, made it part of Europe. Peter brought the greatest architects to build him a capital which was to be the most elegant of all Europe and the embodiment of the new spirit of Russia. The most clever dramatists came from France to compose the royal entertainments. The most impassioned operatic producers of Italy translated their blood and thunder into Russian. Sinful, said the church. And Peter lashed out at its authority. With Peter and with the empresses Elizabeth and Catherine II, who followed him, the court of Petersburg became the most fashionable and luxurious and frivolous of Europe. The aristocracy didn't need much persuasion to adopt the manners and morals of the West. To speak French was accounted the prerequisite of position, to know the latest areas of Chimarosa, the worthy accomplishment of ladies of fashion. But beneath it all, beneath the effete maneuvering of fashion and fancy, there still lay the stern, forbidding conscience of Russia. And so the time of discovery was at hand. The search for a national artistic identity had begun. Russia began to produce artists of her own who derived their technique from the West, but through it expressed themselves with a fervor and an intensity which, well, which sounded rather exotic, rather Russian. And so the trade of musical composition became a two-way proposition, and Germany and France and Italy took note, rather skeptically at first, of strange, arresting primitives like Michael Glinka and Mili Belakirev. <laughs> Kirov and Glinka um, had the same outlook. There were many whose outlook was scarcely touched by their environment, to whom the vast brooding canvases of the nationalists were simply misshapen hulks of disorder. Asiatic Bruckners, Hans von Bülow rather maliciously called them. And for men like Anton Rubinstein and Alexander Glezunov in a later generation, it was order that was needed, order and symmetry. And these were Western qualities. And so the controversy raged, and alliances were joined, and friendships lost. And then there came figures who seemed to reconcile, by their genius, both aims. Composers like Tchaikovsky, who brought to the forms and disciplines of Western music the spiritual legacy of Russia. Who brought to the excesses of Wagnerian tonality the reproving, mystic glow of the Russian liturgy. <laughs> 
And so, within a few generations, Russian music had forged for itself a place in the world. And in the early years of this century, Russian musicians engaged in some of the most inventive and resourceful musical adventures of the day. And composers like Alexander Skriabin and Nicholas Miaskovsky, and they're both vastly underrated composers, by the way, seemed to promise that, musically speaking at least, it might almost be Russia's century. And then, as the saying goes, comes the revolution and an eruption of shattering consequence to all the arts. Among the generation that attained its majority in the post-revolutionary years was a teenager with weak eyes and a shy smile and a profoundly Russian soul, Dmitry Shostakovich. Shostakovich was only 19 when Leningrad heard the debut of his first symphony, a work of such prodigious accomplishment that it could easily be ranked with other teenage miracles like Bizet's C major or Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night Music. Here was a young man who seemed to be at home in the great world. He seemed to possess, in addition to those specially Russian attributes of orchestral color and rhythmic tenacity, the harmonic sophistication of the German post-romantics. And in his postgraduate work, the first symphony, Shostakovich already seemed to possess that gift above all gifts which sets the true symphonist apart, the ability to suggest from the first note of his work to the last a sense of dimension and space which will allow the genuine symphonic structure to take place. carried Shostakovich exultantly into a period of disciplined experimentation. He wrote quickly and easily, if rather unevenly sometimes, but wrote with that special exuberance which is the property of the very young. In many of his early works, like the First Symphony, Shostakovich was to a degree affecting a synthesis of all those qualities in his predecessors and contemporaries which he most admired. Not all of his writing at this period contains the twilight shades of the First Symphony, which you just heard. Much of it, wisely or not, contains elements of that style of aesthetic barbarism which marked the reaction of the then middle-aged Stravinsky to German post-romanticism. But in whatever style Shostakovich wrote, there was about his early works that quality of vitality, of joie de vivre, which he brought to the fascinating, exhausting, challenging exploration of 20th century music. And then it happened. On January morning in 1936, Shostakovich, not yet 30, awoke to find himself the center of a vicious attack in the editorial pages of Pravda, an attack which sounded the opening shot in the Soviet Union's ruthless battle to secure total control of musical production, to make artistic expression the tool of political strategy. The specific subject of the attack was Shostakovich's wildly successful opera, Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk, which had been playing to full houses for two years. But the implications of the attack were as wide as the field of music itself. Notice was served henceforward that the primary function of music in the USSR was to serve the purposes of the state. It was to attempt to convey to the widest possible audience the fundamental aspirations of Soviet society. It was to speak with hope and courage of such things as socialist optimism and proletarian triumph. And it was to do this in a language readily accessible to all. Like all pronouncements of Soviet policy of the period, these musical critiques were based less on some astral vision of the future, but more on the bitter condemnation of the bourgeois past. Consequently, all significant contemporary trends in the West were assailed as the nihilistic vulgarity of a decadent society. And it seemed for a time as though, with the morning edition of one newspaper, that precious contact with the totality of Western civilization, for which the Russian intellectual had striven for two centuries, was to be lost irretrievably. The effect on the sensitive Dmitry Shostakovich of seeing himself the central figure in this vain and foolish struggle between art and politics was overwhelming. Shostakovich, whatever his private political feelings may have been, and he was and is very probably fanatically loyal to the regime, was first and foremost an artist, and by the very nature of his education and the breadth of his enthusiasm, an internationalist. For two years, as his inner dilemma raged, Shostakovich wrote nothing at all, and then he began a series of compositions which, while in one sense they picked up the traces of his already budding neoclassic interest of some years previous, were more often than not notable for a kind of wrong-headed simplicity. The most famous of these works was the Fifth Symphony, with which Shostakovich finally redeemed himself in the eyes of the party. Its successor, and in the field of chamber music, by far his most successful work, is the piano quintet. The quintet is indeed a very fine work by a potentially great composer, but at the same time we can't help but feel that it's the limitations externally imposed upon it that, for all its luster, 
makes this work so very heartbreaking.